Thank you very much. I thought I'd start by talking about some mail-in voting that just was revealed, uh, just the news. Half a million incorrect absentee ballot applications were sent all across the state of Virginia, including to many dead people. Uh, this was an unprecedented mailing flub that's heightened concerns about the integrity of expanding mail-in voting and mail-in voting efforts. It's a disaster. All over Virginia, half a million votes. So that's uh, something you have to think about. We don't want to have a rigged election. I know that. And you have to be very careful when you mention, uh, as you constantly do, Russia, or you mention China, or you mention Iran, or others that attack our election system. And when you have this mail-in voting, it's a uh, — it's very susceptible. It's a, something that can be easily attacked by foreign countries and by, frankly, Democrats and by Republicans. And I think that it's something you have to start thinking about very seriously. Uh, our system is not equipped for it. The post office is not equipped for it. And people should vote like they did in World War I and World War II. And your numbers will be — in 90 days or less, your numbers will be very good, I think, much better on the coronavirus or the China virus. But it's something you have to look about — look at and, and say, this is just crazy. This just came out. Half a million incorrect ballot applications sent all over the state of Virginia to many people that weren't living. They had some sent to pets, dogs. This is what we're going to get into, and it's going to be a disaster. And it's going to be thought of very poorly. It's going to hurt our country. After our news conference Saturday night and the pro-growth announcement, we're pro-jobs, pro-health safety, executive orders, the stock market went up 358 points today. So we — we issued those executive orders, and the stock market went up 358 points today. It's quite a reaction. The Dow Jones and the S&P 500 are now up 50 percent since March. 50 percent. Think if you had money in there. If you put your money in in March, you're 50 percent. The Nasdaq index continues to set new records. It's been up over 14 times. New record in Nasdaq. And uh, the S&P 500 and the Dow, Dow Jones, are going to be — I mean, the way they're going, it looks like they're just about going to be topping records, hopefully Sir. soon. Excuse me?
Yeah, hey, Dan, I'm here in the briefing room, and I'm going to have to leave in a couple of seconds here because the president's coming back in. I was out at our North Lawn position uh, just as the president started his news conference and heard a couple of what sounded either like gunshots or firecrackers. It was difficult uh, to ascertain exactly what it was, but it was two pops uh, very close together, very loud. Secret Service uh, sprang into action, uniformed division, as well as the agents, and you saw them take the president his way, as well as the cat team. Hang on two seconds. Hi. It's John, can you tell me what happened? Yeah, yep, yep. Yep. Uh, okay, Reed one person. John Roberts right. is getting a phone call Great, with thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Dana, so apparently uh, shots were fired at 17th and Penn. Uh, this was not initiated by the Secret Service. These shots came from somewhere else. And apparently now the Secret Service is rendering aid to someone who was hit. So we do not know if it was a self-inflicted gunshot wound or if somebody was shooting at someone else. Uh, but again, this was the 17th and Penn, just as the president started. Uh, these were, this, there, there is a Secret Service station there, of course, there's security all over, but all these right. shots were not initiated by uh, the Secret Service. I'm going to turn it to Brett Baer. So thank you very much, sorry for that. The, there was a shooting outside of the White House and seems to be very well under control. I'd like to thank the Secret Service for doing their uh, Always quick and very effective work, but there was an actual shooting, and uh, somebody's been taken to the hospital. I don't know the condition of the person. It seems that the person was was shot by Secret Service. So we'll see what happens. And uh, yeah, did you have something? Going? Are there no, we, there are no details. We just found out just now. Uh, it was outside of the White House, this area right over here, and uh, they'll have details for you in a little while. Somebody is taken to the hospital. It seems that the shooting was done by law enforcement at that person, at the suspect. It was the suspect who was shot, and this just took place. A couple of people outside. Uh, I noticed uh, a man named John Roberts, who you know very well. Uh, he reported that he heard shots. He was outside and he heard two shots. We don't know yet. We don't know. They're, they're going to find out. Do you know if the individual said anything, sir? We don't know that yet. No. We don't know that yet. It seems to be. Yeah. It seems to be. Where were you taking, Mr. President? Were you taking to the bunker? No, we're taking just out over to the Oval Office. What did the Secret Service tell you when you were outside of the room? Uh, just told me when he came up, you pretty much saw it like I did. He said, sir, could you please come with me? So you were surprised. I was surprised also. I think it's probably pretty unusual, but uh, very, very professional people. They do a fantastic job, as you know. So it seems to me, it seems to be from what I was said, there was uh, a shooting. It was uh, law enforcement uh, shot someone, seems to be the suspect, and the suspect is now on the way to the hospital. I can't tell you the condition of the suspect. There was nobody else injured. There was no other law enforcement injured. And I just want to, I will get on to the press conference, but I, I do want to thank Secret Service. They, they are fantastic. The job they do, uh, from what I understand, the answer is yes. That's what I understand. I don't know. You'll have to ask me. I don't know that, no. I don't know. You'll have to get there. They'll have a, they'll have a detailed, maybe a briefing for you outside later. I don't know. I didn't ask that question. It might not have had anything to do with me. It might have been something else. But uh, it was on the outside of the premises. The wall, the, uh, the as you know, the fencing, especially the new fencing that they put up, is uh, very powerful. Uh, but it was on the outside of the White House. Okay? And they'll have a full report. Secret Service, in a little while, will have a full report. I don't know. Do I seem rattled? It's uh, unfortunate that this is a uh, world, but the world's always been a dangerous place. It's not something that's unique. Uh, the world has been, you look back over the uh, centuries, the world has been a dangerous place, very dangerous place, and uh, it will continue, I guess, for a period of time. 
differently about your personal safety inside the White House? No, I feel very safe with uh, Secret Service. They're fantastic people. They're the best of the best, and uh, they're highly trained. Uh, I don't know if anybody got to walk outside, but uh, there were a lot of uh, terrific-looking people ready to go if something was necessary. Uh, people at the highest level of law enforcement. There's nobody like these people. So they just wanted me to step aside for a little while just to make sure that everything was cleared outside because it was right in this area. Why, so. why did you come back, Mr. President? Why did you decide after that? Because obviously it created a lot of commotion. What made you decide to come back and continue the briefing? Well, I didn't even think about not coming back. I said, am I able to go back? And they said, you'd have to wait a little while. I waited a little while, as you know, in the Oval Office area. And uh, I said, can I get back now? And they said, yes. And they have a lot of fortification outside, just in case. But it was one person. Okay. You said, the shooting, you said the shooting was outside. How far away from the White House? Well, they're going to be giving you a full briefing in a little while. I can only tell you they're going to give you a briefing. It, it was outside of the premises, near the fence, but outside of the premises. So pretty near close to here. Yeah, pretty close. So I was telling you that the Dow Jones and the S&P 500 are now 50 percent above the. March level, NASDAQ is uh, setting new records. It's already broken the record despite the situation of having the China virus. We have new jobs arising and unemployment is falling faster than nearly anyone thought. And over the past three months, we've created over 9 million jobs. And that's a record, a three month record. If you add it up, it's a three month record by far. And we've beaten expectations by 12 million, or 12 million above expectations, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, today we had great reports on new job openings, and there's clearly a housing boom, which has been incredible numbers in both housing and an automobile boom. Uh, we've rarely seen anything like it, and it's going on right now in America. Inventories are at rock bottom. Used car sales are at record levels. And we will have rebuilt. We're doing a rebuilding like nobody's ever seen. It's a big plus for manufacturing and construction. So construction's uh, getting close to record territory. Manufacturing's doing very well. The car companies are doing great. Very happy for Michigan, the state of Michigan. We have a lot of car companies moving in. A lot of plants are being built and expanded in Michigan and Ohio. There is no reason why the economy can't grow at a 20 percent pace in the third quarter. That would be a record. And interestingly, it'll be a, uh, a number that's going to be announced before November 3rd. It gets uh, announced probably around November 1st, which is very interesting. But it's, it's going to grow at a very substantial pace based on all of the numbers we're looking at, and probably a lot more substantial than we originally thought. We're creating new incentives for work and jobs, and we're also providing much-needed assistance to those who are still suffering from the effects of the pandemic contraction. And the contraction is now, uh, well, we have the pandemic. We have a lot of great things happening in terms of the vaccines and therapeutics, as you know. And um, I think we'll be making tremendous progress over the next period of a few months and certainly before the end of the year. I think we'll have a, a vaccine before the end of the year, very substantially. And we may have a therapeutic uh, resolvement very quickly, very, very quickly. And frankly, that's the one I'd rather have faster because you'd go in, you'd give a transfusion or a shot to people that are very ill and they'd be able to come out of the hospital the next day or a few days later if the States participate in our core-sharing unemployment plan. We are uh, going to be doing something very, very interesting with uh, all of the things that we announced on Saturday. I don't have to repeat what they are. You know very well. And uh, we've, had, we've had some tremendous success already. If you look at what's happening with the stock market, and people are very thrilled at what we're doing, uh, we'd like to get the Democrats to focus on other than what they're focusing on, which is a bailout of poorly running states. We have many great running states, states that are setting records. And uh, let's see what happens with respect to that. 
But the uh, we're looking at also considering a capital gains tax cut, which would create a lot more jobs. So we're looking very seriously at a capital gains tax cut and also uh, at an income tax cut for middle income families. We're looking at expanding the tax cuts that we've already done, but specifically for middle income families. And you'll be hearing about that in the upcoming few weeks. And I think it'll be very exciting. So a capital gains tax is going to be a lot of a lot of people put to work and uh, it will be a cut in the capital gains tax and also a cut in the middle income income tax. So I now want to just discuss a little quick brief and then we'll take a few more questions. But uh, we took some who would have known we were going to take questions before we started, right? Is that right, Jennifer? But uh, that's the way it happens sometimes. We want to discuss, if we might, the China virus and the world continues its fight against this horrible plague. Countries in every continent are seeing increases in cases. Uh, we have a rapid increase only in cases uh, where it's very interesting because we're so far ahead of testing, we have more cases. If we had much smaller testing would have fewer, but we feel that having testing is a very important thing. It's a great, uh, it's a great record to have. In many ways, we we've tested, I guess, close to 65 million people right now, and nobody's even close to that number. No other country is close. India would be second at 11 million, and they have 1.5 billion people. Uh, so we uh, we have the number one testing anywhere in the world by far, and. We also have, I think, the highest quality tests. We have a lot of different ones, but we have the highest quality, including the short term and the lab tests. The lab tests take a little bit longer. And uh, Dr. Burks was telling me a little while ago that uh, we're down to two days and two and a half days on getting your result on the lab test. The other ones, you get them in five minutes to 15 minutes. So that's exciting. But countries in every continent are seeing increases in cases. In recent days, cases have rapidly increased in Japan and Australia, unfortunately. And they're now experiencing higher peaks than they did in March. To the south of a border, of our border, cases have continued to surge in Mexico, Central America, Argentina, Colombia, Peru, Brazil, and throughout Latin America. It's really the hot spot. It's posing a major challenge for uh, this continent. Latin America is now the region with the most number of confirmed cases by far, despite a relative scarcity of testing. So when you think of that, that means it's uh, it's uh, pretty much on fire. They're having a hard time, and we're helping them. We're sending them tremendous numbers of ventilators, which we're making by the thousands every month. And we're helping Latin America very much. Uh, it's hard for them to come into the country because we have big sections of wall up now. The new wall is being built, which people don't talk about. They used to talk about nothing but the wall. Now that it's being built, they're not talking about it so much. But it's helped us because we're up to almost, we're getting close to 280 miles, 280 miles in the most important areas. So that's uh, helping us a lot in terms of not having people come in to the country who are uh, infected with the coronavirus. This global trend underscores the persistence of the virus, including in nations that apply the strictest and most punishing lockdowns. You have nations that are really tough on the lockdowns, and they're getting hit very hard. That's why my administration is pursuing a science-based approach that protects the most vulnerable, preserves hospital capacity, and focuses on the delivery and development of treatments and ultimately the vaccine. I feel strongly that we will have a vaccine by the end of the year, and it'll be put in service maybe even as we get it, because we're all set militarily. We're using our military to distribute the vaccine. And logistically, uh, there's nobody like this group of people. I meet with them a lot, and they're ready to go. As soon as they have it, they'll be going. But more importantly, uh, the therapeutics, as I said, I think the therapeutics could be great. Initially speaking, I think that would be if I had my choice. But you're going to have them both. You're going to have them both. You're going to have them both very soon, too. At the same time, we urge all Americans to apply common sense mitigation. You all know what that mitigation is. Everybody knows it by heart now. 
Nearly half of all of the deaths from the China virus in the United States have occurred in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. That's why we have delivered funding, equipment, and rapid testing to our nation's nursing homes to protect those at high risk. We're very focused on nursing homes and senior citizens areas. Anywhere that we have senior citizens, we're very, very focused. We've delivered over 1,800 rapid point-of-care testing devices. Those are very quick. And shipped over 700,000 tests to nursing homes. The nursing homes are being protected like never before. The United States faces a unique range of challenges that requires our constant vigilance. America has the largest at-risk population of any developed country. By far, 1.5 million residents of nursing homes, about five times that of the United Kingdom and other European countries. Our country also has a higher prevalence of underlying conditions that this virus targets. Yet we have fewer deaths per capita than the United Kingdom and most other peer nations in Western Europe. So that's an important. We have fewer deaths per capita than the United Kingdom and most other nations in Western Europe and heading for even stronger numbers. But one person is too much, as far as I'm concerned. Should have never been allowed to happen. Should have never been allowed to escape China. Nationwide, we continue to see encouraging signs. In the last seven days, nationwide cases declined by 14 percent. Hospitalizations decreased by 7 percent. Fatalities decreased by 9 percent. Arizona and Florida are improving rapidly with fewer patients coming to emergency rooms by far, as well as decreasing cases, decreasing fatalities, and expected and expanded hospital capacities. So we have an expanded hospital capacity. It's, uh, it's pretty dramatic when you look at it, uh, meaning we have more room should we need it. So a lot of tremendous work has been done. In Texas, likewise, the number of patients going to emergency rooms has dropped from July by more than two-thirds. That's a lot. Nevertheless, we continue to monitor Texas very closely. Terrific governor, terrific people working on that whole situation in Texas, especially at its test positivity rate, which rose uh, over 20 percent this weekend overall. Cases in Texas are coming down and have stabilized in the border counties. That's, again, where you have the wall and you're next to, uh, in, in some cases, the wall. In some cases, you'll have it very shortly. You'll have it all built within a number of months. But those areas were hit very hard, and there are likely cases uh, from Mexico that come in back and forth from the border. They come in illegally. As doctors have found more effective ways to treat patients, the fatality rate continues to improve. Texas has one-sixth the fatality rate of New York and New Jersey that they had in April. And uh, the, if you look at New York and New Jersey, they work very, very hard, but very heavy density and there are a lot of different kinds of difficulty. The fatality rates in Florida and Arizona are between 25 and 33 percent of the peak rates of New York and New Jersey. Again, different different climate, a different uh, grouping, a different uh, density, tremendously different density. In California, the situation is starting to stabilize and improve throughout the major metropolitan areas. Statewide, hospitalizations continue to decline very substantially, with about 20 percent fewer inpatients now than on July 21st. California is starting to really show signs of uh, correcting. We're monitoring regions with increasing cases, including Boston, Chicago, and the Midwest, and we're monitoring them very, very strongly and uh, very, very hard. I, I do want to say that uh, I think at the end of a fairly short period of time, you're going to be in very, very good shape all over our country. Every loss of life is tragic, and all nations must work together to defeat this horrible virus. My administration is going to continue to save as many lives as possible. We are working round the clock, everybody. I mean, it's uh, incredible how hard they're working. And uh, people from other countries, we're working with them also, and they're working very hard. This is something that's now attacked 188 different countries. There are a wide range of factors that determine how the virus impacts a nation. 
such as age, underlying conditions. Underlying conditions is a uh, very big one. If you're, if you're sick in any way, if you're if especially they say heart and diabetes, that's not a good thing to have if you uh, if you're going to have this, if you're going to catch it, so we're trying to protect especially those people that have problems with their heart or diabetes and levels of pre-existing immunity resulting from past exposure to other viruses, which happens. We must stop politicizing the virus and instead be united in our condemnation of how this virus came to America, how this virus came to the world, and we're going to figure it out, and we're going to find out, and we're very angry about it. On the therapeutics and vaccine updates, three vaccine candidates are currently in phase three clinical trials, something that would have been impossible under the previous administration or any other administration. And several others are showing considerable promise. We have uh, Great companies, very well-known companies. I think everyone in this room would know these companies, but they're the biggest and the best in the world. And we're working with uh, other foreign com companies and countries that have, have been really working very closely with us. We're trading. We're not looking to uh, do anything but come up with the answer. And we really don't. We don't care. We want to come up with the answer. If it's one of ours or one of theirs, it's okay. We have to come up with the answer, and we're very close to getting it. Some people think we have it. We may have it. We have the best scientists in the world racing to develop a safe vaccine that will end this pandemic, save millions of lives, and that's millions of lives all over the world, and end the harm inflicted by this virus to our society and to all other nations. Last week, the NIH began a clinical trial of remdesivir paired with another approved antiviral drug. and anti-inflammatory drug. You know that remdesivir has been very successful, and now they're experimenting with others, including antivirals and anti-inflammatories, and uh, they're having some very interesting success. We've secured enough remdesivir to treat over 650,000 patients. On Saturday, I took executive action in its signing to save American jobs and support American workers, I signed directives to give a payroll tax holiday with the understanding that uh, after the election, on the assumption that it would be victorious for an administration that's done a great job, uh, we will be ending that tax, we'll be terminating that tax. Uh, on the other hand, the other group wants to raise taxes and they may want to leave it where you pay it, but the uh, payroll tax is a big deal for people. It's a tremendous saving for people, and we're going to be doing it, and we intend to terminate it at the end of the appropriate period of time. It's for those making less than $100,000 to the end of 2020 to provide an extra $400 per week also in unemployment benefits and to extend the freeze on home evictions. We want to extend the freeze so people aren't evicted. It's not their fault that the virus came from China. It's China's fault. And to suspend payments on student loans through the end of the year and then beyond. And again, you know, they're paying interest on loans, and, and they're not allowed to go to their college. So we're going to suspend payments on student loans uh, through the end of the year, and then another extension, most likely, because it's not fair to the students to, to have to pay when colleges aren't doing the job of getting open. And I think probably many of them could be open. So I want to thank you all. I'm sorry for the disturbance before. Things happen. And uh, if you'd like, we take a few questions. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. President. I appreciate it. Um, Haley said earlier today that you've been working around the clock, so there's no delay to get these um, enhancement unemployment payments to Americans. Yeah. Can you give me your timetable? Are we talking next week, two weeks, a month? See what is it? Within the next week or two, the states will be in So, Mr. Secretary, you're saying when? I think within the next week or two, most of the states will be able to execute. Got it. And By most the way, of the, the, the gentlemen, you know everybody, you know Russell, you know, but this is Scott Atlas. Do you know that? Right? Yes. Scott is a very famous man. 
who's uh, also very uh, highly respected, Stanford, and he's working with us and will be working with us on the coronavirus. And he has uh, many great ideas, and he thinks what we've done is really good, and now we'll take it to a new level. And so it's great to have Scott working along with us, and we appreciate it very much, Scott. Thank you very much. Really, we've had some great discussions. To follow up on that, Mr. President, if you don't mind, you mentioned the states. Have all the governors signed on to this? Uh, we just had a meeting with the governors, and they were very anxious to get money for the people in their states. And if they, uh, depending on the state, we have the right to do what we want to do. We can terminate the 25 percent. Uh, or we don't have to do that, so we'll see what it is. It depends on the individual state. But a lot of money will be going to a lot of people very quickly. And I've instructed the Secretary of the Treasury to move as quickly as he can, right? So we'll get it done. Yeah, please. I have a question about coronavirus. I wanted to just ask you to be clear on the incident outside. There's a fairly significant perimeter around the White House. It doesn't concern you at all that someone who was armed was able to get so close that you needed to be removed from the briefing room. Well, I don't know if he was close or not, he or she. I don't know if it was a he or she. But um, I have such confidence in these people. They're so good. And I don't think the person breached anything. It was on the outside ground. So I don't believe anything was breached. I asked that question. So they were relatively far away. On coronavirus, um, 97,000 children tested positive for coronavirus in the last two weeks in July, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics. Does that give you any pause about no. schools reopening for in-person no. learning? Because uh, they may have, as you would call it a case, it may be a case, but it's also a case where there's a tiny, it's a tiny fraction of uh, death, tiny fraction. And uh, they get better very quickly. Yeah, they have. They may have it for a short period of time, but the, as you know, the the uh, seriousness of it in terms of what it leads to is is extraordinarily small. Very, very much less than one percent. Do you still Jonathan, believe that, that children are essentially immune? Yeah, I think that for the most part they do very well. I mean, they they don't get very sick. They don't catch it easily. They don't get very sick. And according to the people that I've spoken to, they don't transport it or transfer it to other people, uh, or certainly not very easily. So, yeah, I think schools have to open. We want to get our economy going. We have incredible numbers despite this. If we could get this going, I think it's a very important thing for the economy to get the schools going. Jonathan, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, in Ohio a few days ago, you said, uh, quote, uh, Joe Biden has hurt God. He's against God. Um, the Vice President has said that he's a man of deep Catholic faith, that he's credited for helping him endure some immense personal tragedy. So, sir, what did you mean by that when you say that Joe Biden has hurt God or is against God? Well, if you look at the manifesto that, uh, that they've come up with and if you look at their stance on uh, religion and things having to do very importantly with uh, aspects of religion and faith, uh, I don't think a man of uh, deep religion would be agreeing to the Bernie Sanders plan. You take a look at what they have in, and you just, uh, you can't put that into uh, the realm of a religious group of people, I will say that. And I think it's one of the reasons why if you look at polls, which I'm not a big believer in polls, I wouldn't, if I was, I guess I wouldn't be standing here right now. Uh, and by the way, our poll numbers are going up very rapidly, as you know, and Joe's are going down very rapidly. Um, he'll have to come out of the basement, it looks like, pretty soon, because that, uh, you know, it's one of those things. But no, if you look at uh, the manifesto, I call it the manifesto. A lot of people are calling it the manifesto. My opinion, it's further left than where Bernie was before. So normally he'd be left and you'd bring it somewhere a little bit toward the center. But uh, some of the things that they have down there, and I'm not only talking in terms of religion, I'm not talking even in terms of religion, but some of the things they have in the agreement made, and this was an agreement made by Bernie Sanders and Joe, uh, it's a terrible thing. It would be a terrible thing for our country. It will destroy our country. Uh, we will go into a depression. We will put on regulation. We will double and triple taxes. We will it will be terrible for health care, just terrible. You'll have 180 million people lose their health care. 
It will be a terrible, terrible thing for our country. Okay, yeah, please, yeah. Thank you, sir. I'd like to ask you a question about something you said in the Minister as well. You said that uh, you're planning to issue an executive order to ensure that health insurance companies prevent or cover people with yes. pre-existing conditions, and you said that that had never been done before, but that's, that's not the case because that is the law under the Affordable Care Act. So my question is, why do you need to issue an executive well, said, order no, for law that is already yeah, existing? Yeah, but I didn't say, I said as an executive order. I, as you said, said as an executive order, it hasn't been done before. We want to, uh, we want to be able to assure people that pre-existing condition is always taken care of. Uh, as you know, we've done uh, tremendous things having to do with the individual mandate. We got rid of the individual mandate from Obamacare, which really ended Obamacare as it would be officially known because the individual mandate was the biggest part. It was also the most unpopular part where you pay for a ter terrible privilege of overpaying for insurance. You pay not to have to pay for your health care. And that was a disaster for people and a very unpopular that was called the individual mandate and we terminated that and officially terminated that and that was something that we have been given uh, thanks for by many many people but the individual mandate will always be with us the the individual mandate termination will always be they can't start it up in fact I don't even believe you'll have to tell me I don't believe it's been challenged when we ended it and pre-existing conditions the Republicans are 100 percent there and I'll be uh, issuing at some point in the not too distant future a very strong statement on that, probably in the form of an executive order. Why do you need her to do an executive order if it's already a part of it? Just a double law. safety net and just to let people know that the Republicans are totally uh, strongly in favor of pre existing condition taking care of people with pre existing conditions. It's a it's a uh, signal to people, it's a second uh, it's a second platform. We have pre-existing conditions will be taken care of 100 percent by Republicans and the Republican Party. I think it's a very, I actually think it's a very important statement. Yes, please. Uh, Mr. President, do you still intend to try to hold an in-person G7 meeting uh, in the United States at some point in August and September? And have you already sent out invitations to do so? No, we haven't sent out invitations. We're talking to them. As you know, I was on the phone with many of them yesterday with respect to Lebanon which is truly one of the saddest, most catastrophic things I've ever seen. And they have no idea how many people have died. They're having revolution right now in that country. It's uh, just a terrible thing. And But I was yesterday, 8 o'clock in the morning. We, we had a hour time. We had a, a big uh, teleconference call. Some of those people were there. I, I'm much more inclined to do it sometime after the election. We were going to do it in September. They'd like to do it. We could do it through teleconference or we could do it through a meeting. But I, I sort of am now suggesting, I told my people yesterday actually, uh, why don't we do it sometime after the election when things are a little bit, uh, you have a little more time to think about it because it's very important. The G7 is very important. Uh, to that meeting? Uh, I don't know, but we have invited a number of people to the meeting. Uh, I certainly would invite him to the meeting. I think he's an important factor. But uh, we will invite uh, certain people that aren't in the G7. Uh, some people have already accepted. But we're going to be doing it after the election. I think it's a better atmosphere to have a G7. I think it's a lot uh, – I, I think it's a, just a better, calmer atmosphere to have a G7. Yeah, please. Uh, I wanted to ask Secretary Mnuchin, actually, uh, have you spoken to any Democrats since Friday? Have they reached out to you at all about uh, restarting negotiations? I have not spoken to Schumer and Pelosi since then. Do you expect uh, would you reach out at all to them to try to meet? At any time they want to meet, they're willing to negotiate and have a new proposal. We're more than happy to meet. They're hurting people very badly. This would have been so easy for them to do. And I saw that Senator Schumer said today on a show, I don't know what show, but he said today on a show that we should meet, we should do something, but you know. Where has he been for how many week, weeks have you been negotiating? Like four? And uh, they should do something. It would have been so much easier than doing it the way we did it. But we did something that's uh, 
Uh, very important, and frankly, it's been well received. Very well received. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. President. You tweeted earlier today that you're considering Gettysburg as a yeah. venue for your speech for the RNC nomination acceptance. What's your thinking behind that as a possible location? Well, I think it's. I've been to Gettysburg numerous times. It's a national park. It's a national historic site. It's incredible. You know, it's the history. It's incredible, actually, to me. Uh, it was a very important place and is a very important place in our country. So we're looking at that and we're looking at the White House. The White House would be uh, very much easier for Secret Service. You see what just went on here. They're all here. Just like you have your seats, they have their seats at the White House. So there wouldn't be any expense or any extraordinary expense. Uh, and the White House would be a, a lovely place to do it also. The least expensive place that you could do it would be at the White House. It, this is a government, uh, a government expense. And, I, you know, look, I, I watch also with governments. I watch to make sure that we do what's right. But we're looking at Gettysburg and we're looking at the White House. And we have other sites, too, but I think these would be two really beautiful sites. Would Jennifer? Would you envision having an audience for that speech? You could. You have plenty of room at both locations. I see John Roberts. John, uh, you were outside. You said you heard shots fired before? Two shots in rapid succession just after you took the podium. And they were shots, pretty much. It certainly you definitely know the difference. I know that. That's, you know the difference. I, you thought they were shots, John? It definitely sounded like I'm I saw your report inside when I went inside. Uh, it's a good report, too. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, Jennifer, please. Can you give us an update on China? Do you think that your administration will respond to the sanctions that China announced this morning on American officials? Well, we've already responded in many different ways. We're, we're uh, talking a lot about China. We shouldn't have been talking about China. We did a phase one deal, and it was a wonderful deal, and all of a sudden it means very little in the overall import of things. Uh, they should have never allowed what happened to the world, including us. But this was released into Europe, and it was released into the U.S., and it was released all throughout the world, but it wasn't released into China. And we were doing numbers that will, you know, just were incredible. And we hope to be able to do them perhaps even next year. I think we're going to have an incredible year next year, but that will never pay for the loss of life in our country and all over the world. So we are. We view China differently than we did eight months ago. Very much differently. Yes, please. Uh, is there still any consideration of delisting Chinese companies? Is, is that an ongoing discussion? Delisting? Delisting Chinese companies. Uh, we, we never comment on specific things, but no, there's nothing. Could it still be on the table? There's, there's no, again, nothing specifically at the moment. Uh, are you talking about delisting oh, the comments on the exchange? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, so j just to be clear, we, we did make the recommendation, and the SEC will be putting out that, yes, as, as of the end of next year, if they do not fully comply, and that's Chinese companies, any other companies, they all have to comply with the same exact accounting where they will be delisted on the exchanges. I thought well, you meant so I was confused. And Jennifer, we're also talking on the uh, WTO, the World Trade Organization. Uh, China's treated much differently than we are. Uh, this should have been handled many years ago when it first happened, but they're treated as a, uh, as a nation that's uh, developing. They're treated as what they call a developing nation, which gives them tremendous incentives and advantages over and above what the United States gets and over and above what other countries get also. This is a developing nation. I don't think so. I don't think for purposes of what we're talking about it should be. And we are putting in, and we've already put in, a request that China should no longer be declared a developing nation and have advantages over the U.S. And I told them that a year ago, and I told them that two years ago, and we put it in very powerfully, that they should not have advantages over other countries, frankly. And sure, they're not going to have any more advantages over. This should have been done by numerous presidents a long time ago because it gives them a tremendous uh, a tremendous boost over everybody else and it's a very unfair situation no we are upset with china because of what they did china was not good and uh, china will be uh, if you look at what's going to happen whether it's iran uh, iran will make a deal with us in a month 
after the election's over, if we win the election. But their greatest dream in the world is that Joe Biden wins because they will own this country. China will own this country. North Korea will own this country. They will own our country. And they're all waiting to see the election. And if we make a — if we have a win in — on November 3rd, we will uh, have a deal with, in my opinion, Iran within one month. And I don't know that we want to have a deal with China, to be honest with you. So I'm saying to myself, gee, but China wants us to lose very badly. And you know who else is not happy with us winning? Russia. The phony people that tell the story, the fake news stories about Russia. Uh, it was just reported the numbers. Uh, I raised $400 billion extra in NATO. You know that. It went from 130 to $400 billion. And that's a year in order to uh, strengthen up NATO. Nobody says that. We became the biggest uh, energy exporter. We are now — if you look at what we have, we're energy independent. So many different things. Our military is stronger than it ever was. We spent uh, $2.5 trillion on our military. Uh, I exposed the terrible deal between Germany and Russia on the pipeline. Nobody even knew about the pipeline. Nord Stream, Nord Stream 2. Nobody knew about it. Nobody talked about it. I said, what's this all about? So we protect Germany from Russia, and Germany pays Russia billions of dollars a year for energy, and it's a big portion of Germany's energy. If I was a person that was a German citizen, I would not be happy with that deal, because they're at a very big disadvantage. So, uh, no, Russia would not be happy. And uh, I can tell you that China would not be happy at all. Uh, we've taken in tens of billions of dollars as your head of the Treasury, Steve, right? We've taken in tens of billions of dollars from China. We never took 10 cents from China, never — not even 10 cents. And $28 billion we gave to our farmers because they were targeted by China. They were actually targeted. And we gave $28 billion, compliments of China, to our great farmers and ranchers because they were unfairly targeted by China in order to make a better deal with us. I said, we're not going to do that. We're going to — instead of making a better deal, we're going to tariff you at very high numbers, 25 percent, 10 percent, and actually numbers that could go up a lot. And uh, we had a lot of money left over. After giving the $28 billion to — to the farmers and ranchers and some others, frankly, we uh, — we had uh, many, many billions of dollars left over, and we're still receiving that money. Even though we made the deal, we're still receiving that money. So if uh, — if we win the election, we'll have deals with a lot of countries very fast. They're just waiting to see who wins because they are hoping — they are hoping that Joe Biden wins, Sleepy Joe. And if he wins, you know what's going to happen? China will own us. Our markets will crash. The 401ks will go down to practically nothing. Stocks will go down to practically nothing. Remember, stocks — these big companies, they're owned by — millions of people that are carpenters and policemen and farmers and lots of other people. And — and uh, they are the ones that benefit by having a good stock market, probably more than anybody else. But the 401ks, the stocks, the economy will be uh, in a shambles. Uh, they want to raise taxes. They want to triple taxes. They want to raise the corporate tax, but they want to raise all taxes. Ultimately, they can't pay for what they want to do anyway. And what they're going to do is destroy your health care and destroy so many other things. We're going to have 180 million people that are so happy with their private health care, they're going to lose it under this crazy plan that these people are proposing. So you will have a crash like you've never seen before. And I've been very — I've been very good at predicting these things. Yeah, please, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you just mentioned uh, uh, President Putin and the possibility of inviting him here because he's important. Um, your own director of national intelligence has said that Russia is currently planning or actually meddling in the election. Have you raised that directly well, with Putin they, ever? They said uh, China, Russia, Iran, and probably others. But because of the fake news, they seem to think Russia plays the best. So, so what they do — it's all right. Well, I'm just saying the way the politicians — look, the other day they said the three countries. They said China and Russia and Iran. And some reporter got up and said, Russia is meddling. I said, well, didn't it mention China and Iran? Why didn't you mention them, too? So uh, — so I don't know. You know what I'm telling you? I'll tell you who's meddling in our elections. The Democrats are meddling. 
by wanting and insisting on sending mail-in ballots where there's corruption all over the place. If you check what happened in New York, a small, relatively small race with Carolyn Maloney, and they called her the winner the other day because I was mentioning it at conferences and getting a lot of action on that statement. So they called her, they declared her the winner, and they have no idea who won. And the person, her opponent, is very angry. But they had mail-in voting, and they had hundreds and I think even thousands of ballots that are missing, that were fraudulent. Take a look at the Carolyn Maloney race. Take a look at uh, Patterson, New Jersey. Take a look now at this one in Virginia, where they mailed out 500,000 applications, and they go into people that aren't supposed to be getting an application. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir. Secretary Pompeo is heading to Europe again right. this week. Do you have any updates on when the travel restrictions of the EU are going to be listed? It seems strange we're offering exemptions for professional athletes but not the K-1 visa holders, the so-called... Well, we know, try and do the best we can. You have big uh, sporting events, and that's good for our economy, that's good for us, and they do uh, talk about certain exemptions, and they make sure everyone's perfectly tested and everyone comes in 100 percent. But, you know, we do make certain accommodations because you do have star athletes, and that means a good thing for the country. That's economic development, etc. Uh, but we are working very closely with Europe and with other countries to see what's the best timing. Mean, don't forget, I was the one that turned Europe off because they really, uh, they led the way. They led it much more so than we did. We were months following them. And uh, in terms of they got hit earlier than we did, quite a bit earlier than we did. So I put the restrictions on Europe. I put the restrictions on China, which was a great thing to do. In retrospect, we're getting, I mean, that's, that was a very important day. Dr. Fauci said that was one of the most important days. And a lot of people didn't want me to do it, but we first put ban a ban on anybody from China coming in, and then we put a ban on Europe coming in. But we're working very closely with Europe to see when that will all come off. Yeah, please. If 160,000 people had died on President Obama's watch, do you think you would have called for his resignation? No, I wouldn't have done that. I think it's... Uh, uh, I think it's been amazing what we've been able to do. If we didn't close up our country, we would have had one and a half or two million people already dead. Uh, we've called it right. Now we don't have to close it. We understand the disease. Nobody understood it because nobody's ever seen anything like this. The closest thing is uh, in 1917, they say, right? The, the, great, the great pandemic uh, certainly was a terrible thing where they lost anywhere from 50 to 100 million people. Probably ended the Second World War. All the soldiers were sick. Uh, it was a, it was a uh, terrible situation. And this is highly contagious. This one is highly, highly contagious. Now, if I would have uh, listened to a lot of people, we would have kept it open. And by the way, we keep it open now, all the way. We keep it open. But we would have kept it open, and you could be up to a million and a half or two million people right now. One and a half to two million people. Uh, our people have done a fantastic job. Our consultants and our doctors, you know, and with disagreements and with uh, a lot of things happening, what we've done with ventilators has been amazing. What we've done with medical equipment has been incredible. We've supplied the governors. Nobody, not one person in this country that needed a ventilator didn't get it. And, you know, at the beginning, there was a big shortage of ventilators. Nobody had stockpiles or anything comparable to what you had to have. So, uh, we would have lost, if you think about it, you had mentioned 160,000 people. Uh, multiply that times 10 right now. I think it would have been unsustainable and unacceptable. But that's what would have happened had we kept it open. So, uh, no, I think uh, we're a very large country. We are uh, one person. I said all the time, a lot of people like to leave that out. One person is too many. It should have never happened. But they've done a, a really an extraordinary job. They'll never be given the credit, and I'm not talking about me. The people that have worked on this so hard will never be given the credit, but they've done an extraordinary job with a very large, diverse country. Really an extraordinary job. And a lot of the governors who, as you know, they sort of do the micro in their states, and they go up, and I think I can tell you that a lot of the governors have done an extraordinary job, too. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Did you ask the U.S. ambassador in Brazil to focus his efforts in uh, eliminating ethanol tariffs in Brazil? 
Uh, you have to, you, you can't, yeah. Ask the ambassador in Brazil to focus his efforts to lower, to eliminate ethanol tariffs in Brazil. We haven't really discussed that too much, but at some point we probably will be. And uh, we don't want people tariffing us, and if they tariff us, although I must tell you, I have a very good relationship with uh, President Bolsonaro. He's great, he's, and I hear he's doing well. He, he's recovered from having COVID, having COVID-19, as they say, and that's great, and send him my regards. I think that as far as Brazil is concerned, if they do tariffs, we have to have an equalization of tariffs, and we, we are going to be presenting something having to do with tariffs and fairness and fa tariffs, because we have many countries for many years that have been charging us tariffs to do business, and we don't charge them. And it's called reciprocity. It's called reciprocal tariffs. And uh, you may be seeing something on that very soon. Did you have one, OAN? OAN, please. Thank you, Mr. President. First of all, thank you for coming back to finish the briefing. Thank you very much. After the uh, thank you. scuffle. Um, so I have an opinion question for you. Okay. Joe Biden is set to announce his running mate at any time now. We expect him to announce uh, her. Um, many of your supporters feel that the reason that Obama's former NSA, Susan Rice, is at the top of, of Biden's list is that she can best cover up a lot of the Obamagate surveillance crimes that have taken place during your campaign. What are your thoughts? What is your opinion? Do you, do you subscribe to that line of thought? How do you feel about it? Well, look, uh, the Obama campaign spied on our campaign, and they've been caught, all right? And now let's see what happens to them. Uh, but uh, they have been caught. They've been caught red-handed. Uh, it's probably treason. It's a horrible thing they did. It probably never happened before. At least nobody got caught doing it. But they used the intelligence agencies of our country to spy on my campaign, and they have been caught. And uh, there are a lot of people involved. I don't want to say how much she's involved. Frankly, if he chooses her, that's fine, but that's a potential liability. We'll see. But uh, President Obama knew about it. Joe Biden knew about it. Uh, Comey <laughs> knew about it. Brennan, Clapper, the whole group, they all knew about it. Lisa Page and her lover struck, they all knew about it. And we have it documented. We have it in texts. We have it in all sorts of forms. They knew about it. It was a terrible thing. Should have never happened and should never be allowed to happen again to a president. This should never happen again. This was a setup like we've never seen. I think it's the political crime of the century. And they've been caught. So let's see what happens to them all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it was quite a surreal situation and reminiscent of the tail end of the Clinton administration when that man with a rifle started shooting toward the White House. This wasn't that close. It appears to be from some photographs that our Mark Meredith got off a tourist who was in the area to have taken place at the southeast corner of 17th and Pennsylvania Avenue. That would be on the other side of the Eisenhower Executive Office Building. I marked the time down because President Trump had just begun talking. It was about 12 minutes before 6 o'clock. Uh, I was out at our North Lawn position and heard two very loud pops in rapid succession. Uh, one actually sounded louder than the other one, so I don't know if it was two different weapons that were discharged or if it was a single weapon firing in rapid succession. Uh, by the time that we got ushered back in here to the White House, uh, we had discovered uh, that it was an officer-involved shooting and that a man was on the ground receiving treatment from the Secret Service for his wounds and was taken to the hospital for treatment. That would probably Probably be George Washington Hospital, which is just up the street. You remember that's where Ronald Reagan was taken after he was shot uh, back in the 1980s. But uh, upon our return in here to the uh, Brady briefing room, President Trump shortly thereafter came in and had this to say about what he was told by the Secret Service. Just told me when he came up, you pretty much saw it like I did. He said, "Sir, could you please come with me?" So you were surprised. I was surprised also. I think it's probably pretty unusual, but. Uh, very, very professional people. They do a fantastic job, as you know. So it seems to me, it seems to be from what I was said, there was uh, a shooting. It was uh, law enforcement uh, shot someone, seems to be the suspect, and the suspect is now on the way to the hospital. I can't tell you the condition of the suspect. Was the suspect armed? 
There was nobody else injured. There was no other law enforcement injured. The president had only been out of the briefing room for a short time, waiting near the Oval Office. He told the Secret Service, Brett, he wanted to come back in. I think he wanted to show that the shooting wasn't going to distract him from what he was doing here. Brett? John Roberts, um, an interesting day. Monday, <laughs> at the least. White House. Uh, John, thank you, as always, for that reporting.